and welcome to another video from me, Rough Swordsman Wargamer. This time we'll be playing D-Day at Peleliu. So the first thing to do is to get it set up. Now if you're already familiar with the game and know how to set it up, this part probably won't be very interesting, so I'll leave a timestamp in the description so you can skip ahead to turn one. But the first thing we do for the setup is to take the 51 Japanese non-armour units and we're going to place them randomly face down on every position that has an X or an artillery symbol. And the way I do it is I put them in my bag of doom. Right, let's get those out. The 15 that are left over, keep them face down and they will go over here. Next, take the four Japanese tank units, mix them up and put one in each of the armoured positions. Now we can reveal them. Now mix the Japanese armor depth counters face down and put one under each of those tanks. There we go. And then stick a disrupted token on each of them, which means they can't do anything at the start of the game. Get the counterattack depth markers and stick them in a pot or something and put them over to the side. Mix up the Japanese depth markers face down, but again, they're going in my bag. Give them a mix up and place one under B1. B4 and B5. There we are. They say place the remaining Japanese depth markers face down here, but I just leave them in my bag. The eight artillery destroyed counters will go over there. Shuffle up the action cards. There we go. Place the three amphibious tanks in their starting positions. And you can see, hopefully, right here is a little number one. Get in focus. There we go. And also a W1, O1 and O3. That designates the landing zone. So W1 goes here in white one, this one in orange one, and here it is in orange three. The rest of the US units will be placed on the turn track on the turn that they will be coming in. And once again, there's that little number there telling you which turn it comes in. There we go. We'll be playing the shorter scenario, the September the 15th scenario, and that actually ends here. So we don't need 
any reinforcements that come in after that. Get your reduced units sorted out because you're going to need them. Place the phase and turn marker in their starting positions. I think that's it. We're ready for the pre-invasion bombardment. We take the top card of the action deck. And we can see the three colors there on the bottom. And uh, if you watched my <laughs> video about being colorblind, I know from my little uh, cheat list that this is purple, blue, and brown. So every position of those colors will now be disrupted. There we are, I think that's everything. And now we can get rid of the card. And we're ready for turn one. And just to let you know, I'm probably gonna be making mistakes, that's how it goes. But if I do, let me know and we can try and put that right in the next video. Okay, turn one. First thing is the US Amphibious Operations Phase and the Landing Check Cards. But we don't do that for turn one. We've already got those three amphibious tanks, remember. But before we move on, we have to check to see if anything is coming in for the next turn. And there is. There's all of these. So we'll get those down to the landing sites. There we are. We've got a bunch of US units ready to come in on turn two. Back at the uh, phase track, we can now move on. First event phase doesn't occur on turn one, so we can miss that one. Now, Japanese fire phase, we have to take a card. Right, let's see what damage is gonna happen. So we had orangey or yellow or gold, whatever you want to call it, blue and green with the triangle symbol. Just a little note on these dots, in case you are unfamiliar with the game. The solid color dots are known as intense fire and US units in those hexes may be hit regardless of their type or target symbol. And here's the target symbol here, we've got a diamond on that one. And the ones that uh, are sort of quartered, that's steady fire. And US units in those hexes may only be hit if their target symbol is shown on the fire card. In this case, it's the triangle. So let's have a look and see who gets hit. We've got the yellow, I'll call it yellow from now on. I know what I mean. So we've got one here. It's undisrupted and there's a solid yellow circle there. So that one will be hit and we'll lose a step. And if the Japanese unit which attacks is unrevealed, the US unit gets disrupted as well. And when disrupted, you can't do much. Any others? We've got a yellow there, of course, but that's not hitting anything. I think that's it for yellow, blue. Well, they were disrupted with the pre-invasion bombardment. So even though there's one here, can't attack because it's disrupted. So we're safe from blue. It's just green. Disrupted. That's brown, isn't it? There's green. What's this? Here's a green one. Can hit, but this one has already been hit, so you can't be hit twice, thank goodness. Another green one here, I think. Yeah, but it's uh, out of range. Do you know what? I think that might be it. We got off pretty lightly. And just a note for us colorblind people, just to remind you, we might have confusion between these two, but we know this one is to do with that one because that circle is nearer this 
colour. So uh, that's always worthwhile remembering. Now on this card, it has a little artillery symbol and that would mean that the Japanese would be bombarding, first of all, the landing sites. But that doesn't occur on the first turn, so we can skip that, thank goodness. But now we have to remove disruption markers from those colours as well. So yellow, blue and green are going to lose their disruption markers. And I'll do that. There we go, I think I've got them all. Right, what's next? Next would be the second event phase, but that doesn't happen until turn five. So US HQ phase doesn't happen until turn eight. So we're into the US action phase. Well, all we've got to move are our three amphibious tanks. We're only allowed to perform two actions unless they're a free action. No more than one action per unit, so we can't sort of do something twice with uh, a single unit. But later on, when there are stacked units, you can use one action to do something with that stack, but they've all got to do the same thing. So what's this free action then? Units with heroes or inspired marker, HQ units, an infantry unit that's landed on the beach, can move one hex with something called a preservation move, units in command of regimental HQs, all that sort of thing won't be happening till later on. But we haven't got anything like that, we've just got three amphibious tanks, one of which is disrupted so can't do anything. And the other thing is that tanks aren't allowed to do preservation moves, so if they want to move they've got to use their actions. Forgot to mention the little numbers on the units. The first number is its attack strength and the second number is the number of hexes it can attack from. So these can attack from three hexes away. Tanks can't attack unrevealed Japanese units. So there's not a lot these can do except maybe move off the beach. All units can move one to three hexes, but they must stop if they enter a hex with an intense fire marker. Or they'll end their move if they end up adjacent to an enemy unit, even if that enemy unit is disrupted. Or they enter mountain, coral or jungle hexes. There is another thing called an infiltration move, where if a unit attempts to move past an enemy occupied position. So in theory, this would be an infiltration movement because they're moving from this to here, they're adjacent. That would be an infiltration movement as well. But doesn't affect tanks. So for our first action, we're gonna move this here off the beach, can't move anymore because it's now next to uh, an enemy unit and it's in an intense fire hex. This one can't do anything, but we'll move this one. I think we'll move it to, uh, see there's steady fire here, intense fire there. We'll move it here, I think. Again, strategies will be completely different for you. There we are, that's the end of our movement. And at the end, any disrupted US units can remove their disruption markers. So that's that. And that's the end of the US action phase. So we move the phase marker to the end of turn. And what we're doing now is discarding all the cards we drew, so we've got this one and the one we had for the pre-invasion bombardment. We take them and put them to one side. We move the phase marker back to the beginning and the turn marker up to turn two. 
So for turn two, the first thing we do is the US amphibious phase, where we're trying to get all these US units onto the beach. And to do that, we take a card and we're going to look at the very top. And here we can see, oops, we can see a yellow triangle and the words drift left. So for white one, yellow, unfortunately we've got a yellow colour there. This is the one that's firing on us because it's yellow and it's undisrupted. If it was disrupted it wouldn't be able to fire of course, but it can. So it's firing down on these and it's firing in particular to the triangle unit, which is this one. So this one will get turned over and reduced. And uh, a triangle will move to the left, which is this one again. Can't move left because there's nothing there, so it will move right. But these other two are now okay, and we'll be moving on to the beach in a moment. Next, white two. Red triangle. No drift. blue, red, and there's a triangle. And red here is the one that's firing. It's undisrupted, so it will reduce this unit. But there is no drift, so we're okay with that. These can come on now. Orange one. Purple diamond, no drift. Orange one only has yellow and green, so nothing is reduced and nothing drifts. So straight on for them. Orange two. Green circle, no drift. No green here though, and no drift so they can come on, not doing too bad. And lastly, orange three, yellow diamond, drift right, no yellow here, but the diamond will drift right, it can't of course, so it drifts left. And that's it. That's the amphibious phase. And now the US forces can move onto the beach, onto these arrowed hexes. No more than two units per hex. So, I think we'll move. Yes, I could put that on there, but I'm not sure if you can see, we've got four dots here and four dots here. If there are seven or more dots in a stack, that's known as a concentrated stack. And these sort of quartered steady fire circles turn into intense fire. But they're all ready in, you want to know some here, look, these will turn into intense fire. Uh, okay, we'll put it there. Yeah. What we got here, we've got, we can pop, hmm, we can pop those on together. That's only six steps. One there, one there. That couldn't move last time because it's, uh, because it was disrupted. There, there, and there. These are all four steps. That's going to be awkward. One, 
Mind you, there's only one color in this one and it's already intense, so it doesn't really matter at the moment. If I make that a concentrated stack, and there, and then these last two will have one here and one here. Right, last thing to do in this uh, first phase is to bring down any reinforcements that will come in on turn three, and there are, so we'll just bring those down. There we go, quite a few coming on. Got some more tanks here. And we've got these HQs. And they have the ability to issue a free action to any infantry unit it is stacked with. And incidentally, the reason these are placed here at the end of the amphibious phase is in case the Japanese get an artillery icon on their card, they can actually go after these. So that's why they're placed there before they're needed. Okay, let's see what's next. Next then is the first event phase. So we take a card and we're looking at this bit here. And these are the turns that uh, they are apply in. So turns two to 12, we're using this one. Place a hero marker on any US unit and add a depth marker to one Japanese unit. Hmm. Okay. So we grab a hero. Here we are, picked one randomly. We've got Pope. We can put him on any US unit. So I think we'll plop him there. And that will give that unit a free action. But now we've got to place a depth marker on one of these Japanese units. And it says, to place a depth marker, choose a Japanese unit without one already. Tanks can't have them. If there's more than one eligible Japanese unit without a depth marker, choose a unit based on the following priorities. So, choose the Japanese unit closest in hexes to a US unit. Well, we've got a couple of those, haven't we? That's already got a depth. So as that, we've got this one, this one, and this one. If two more units are equidistant, choose a unit in a position adjacent to a beach landing hex. So there's that one and that one. If there is still more than one eligible unit, place the depth marker in the position with the lowest ID number. Right, that's a six. That's a nine. He's getting it. Bag of doom. Make sure we take it face down. There we go. We'll place it under there. There we are. That's that done. Next, oh, here we go. Japanese fire phase. What are we getting this time? I think I mentioned it in the video, but these letters don't mean anything at the moment. Next turn they will. So we've got number 21. That's red, purple and blue. So, red. Oh, is this? oh crikey, look, this one just had a blooming depth marker on it. Because it's got a depth marker, it can hit two units. And it's got a choice of these three here, or that one even. No, that's this one. That's why it's so handy, knowing that because that's pointing that way, it's on that hex side. It's to do with that one there. So it's this one. And this one. And this one. And that one. Oh, crikey. So two units have got to be hit. So you always hit the units with the most steps. So what do we got here? This is closer as well. So we'll have that one. That's annoying. 
and it's disrupted because they are unrevealed. Well, that's just scuppered my plans. Oops. I've got to hit another one because it's got a depth marker. So it's one of these two. It's my choice then. Uh, I'll have that one. And disrupted. I think that's the only one. Okay, purple. Disrupted. I think they're still all disrupted, aren't they? Yeah. Well, that's lucky. And blue. Oh, no. Look. Another one with a depth marker. So uh, we're not having much luck. So two hits. So this has got... They've all got four. That one's going to be hit because it's closer, I suppose. And disrupted. And it's either this one or this one. This, this everybody says this area here is just bonkers. So we'll have this one because I don't think many are going to make it through. <laughs> And disrupted. Any more? There's a blue there. This has got a steady fire for blue. And it's a circle, so no. That's a triangle. No. But there's a tank up here that's now undisrupted. So tanks. This tank here. Even though it's got a different colour spot on it, because it's in a blue position, it's classed as a blue tank. If it was out in the open, then that uh, colour on the tank itself, yellow I believe, would be the colour you use. Tanks though have a sort of default tank action, and that's fire or advance. Now tanks can fire one hex out from their colour, so the blue one here, it would be able to fire out here. Only as steady fire, but that's something we've got to watch out for when these tanks start moving down, which this one is about to. As it can't fire, it will now advance, and it will advance into a position that is nearer the US troops. And that position mustn't be more than three hexes away. So there's this position here, this one, and that's more than three hexes away. That's got a tank in. You can't uh, use a position that has a tank in it. So it looks like this one. But as you can see, it's already occupied. It can move into that, but this unit here must be able to trace Japanese communication. And a Japanese unit is in communication if it can trace a path back to at least two other Japanese occupied positions or position groups. And those paths mustn't go through any US occupied hexes, of course. But at this stage of the game, we can see that this one is in communication. That's not a problem. So what will happen now is this one will go into this space but this unit will swap places with it and end up there so this tank now is creeping nearer so that's the end of the Japanese fire phase we now move in to the second event phase but of course that doesn't happen until turn five and this one can be skipped as well because that doesn't happen till turn eight. So we're back to the US action phase. US action phase. But before we do that, I've just realised I haven't uh, given you the victory conditions. Probably the reason for that is I haven't uh, won it yet. But as we're playing the shorter scenario, at the end of turn 12, we have to determine whether or not we win or lose this scenario. And there are three goals. If we get two of them, we win. 
So these three goals are secure 10 position hexes that project fire onto the US landing beach hexes. So that's all these. Secure 14 position hexes in zone B. A position may count for both the first goal and this one. So that's these are all up here. And the third goal is secure coral positions A5 and A6. Mind you, never know. So the US action phase. We've got our two actions here. What I might do first is do the preservation moves, get them off the beach. Because we've got a few more units coming on next turn. So we'll pop it there. Or should we pop it there? Let's pop it there. And that can't do much anyway. And thanks to Tony from Tony's Board Life. Give me that little tip about turning the units that have done something. That was on his playthrough videos of D-Day at Peleliu. So thanks, mate. We'll move this one up here. Preservation move. This one, I think I'm going to use an action and get it into there just so we can occupy it. Most tricky Japanese can't reinforce in there. So yeah, we can move three hexes and the brush doesn't hinder us. So we'll move one, two. We have to stop there because we're next to Japanese unit and also we've gone into the jungle. So I'll pop that on there. Move this off here. Preservation. Uh, this one and this one off here, taking a bit of a chance. And this one off of here. These are all preservation moves. I understand that can't use a preservation move because it's already on the beach from last turn. You have to use it on the turn you hit the beach. But this one can go on. These can't do anything, they're disrupted underneath that hero. What have we got here? Got two there. Can't move that one unless we use an action because that would be an infiltration move. Just trying to sneak past this occupied position, but this one can move. Hmm. These can't move either. Don't want to move that one. Now I can either move this off the beach and use that action or attack with these. I know it's got a depth marker and these depth markers means that that Japanese unit is fully alert, ready for action. It will be harder to attack than if it didn't have one, but it will reveal it. Or I can move this off the beach. We've only got two, we can just about see them here coming on next turn and they could probably go there. So what I think I'll do is use my last action and we'll attack with these two reduced units. We haven't got a full complement of weapons because as you'll see, when we turn that uh, unit over, there will be certain weapons we're going to have to be able to use. And on these handy dandy handouts here, you can see that a full four step unit has everything. We've got three steps and now we've only got these. We've got the Browning automatic rifle. We've got demolition, charge and a radio. And on this other one, we've got the bar, bazooka and demolition charge. So we'll see how we go with that. Now what was confusing me about attacks was I've seen some people doing playthroughs where say this wasn't disrupted, they'd say they'd attack with this one 
and they would include all those that are around it. I think what is a little bit ambiguous is this here, eligible to attack. An attack must include at least one infantry, HQ, blah, 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 attacking a Japanese occupied hex from an adjacent hex. As long as this requirement is met, other units may join in the attack against the same Japanese occupied hex. But for free, but down there, it says attack is an action. Each unit participating in an attack against a single Japanese occupied hex must conduct an action in order to participate in the attack. A unit unable to conduct an action may not attack. So I read that as you want to attack with more than one on a single hex, you have to use actions. So let me know if that's not right, because these can't join in. So we're going to attack with this one or these two. So that's my last action. So we reveal what we're up against. Oh, it's this one. Oops. And we've got, oh. It's only a one, but you see down the bottom left there, we've got FL, which is flamethrower and BZ, which is Bazooka. Don't think we've got all those. The only units that have got a flamethrower are the amphibious tanks, if they're adjacent, but that's not in the attack. Heavy weapons infantry and an infantry HQ, which not, are not coming on till next turn. So on the first column here, it says US attackers possess required weapons. No. Then we look at the strength, US attack strength compared to Japanese defense strength, one. And we've got 10, I think we had here. Yep. Just checking, we haven't got a flame. No, we haven't, no. So we're at least double. So now we move along here and see what it says. And we're looking at Japanese unit and unrevealed depth marker. And it says for that, the Japanese are disrupted. So we've done something at least. I knew we weren't going to be eliminating that unit, but now it is disrupted. And I think, I'll just turn that so I know we can't do anything with that. Could move it here. No, can't amount of actions. I think that's it. This one can't move. So the only thing to do now is to remove the disrupted tokens from our boys. There's one under here, isn't there? And this one. Hope that's right. Take off the US actions and turn all the units back to where they were. There we go. So back up to the top just to finish off turn two. So there we are. End of turn. So. We discard all the cards from the card track. So we'll get rid of these, excuse me. And we have to keep an eye on the discard pile because if it ever gets more than the deck we're drawing from, we have to shuffle them back in. So we just pop that back over here and we move the turn marker. And look, there's an M. That's now becoming part of the game. So here's one of the discarded cards. If we now get any with the letter M on them, things will happen. And we're ready to start another turn. Well, I think we'll leave it there. 
We've done the setup and we've got a couple of turns under our belt. So we'll see what happens next time. But just before I go, yes, as noted in the video, these shouldn't have moved because that was an infiltration move, moving from adjacent to an enemy position to another one. So just move that back. Hope that's put that right. So this has been part one of a playthrough of D-Day at Peleliu, designed by John Butterfield and published by Decision Games. And we'll see how we get on in the next one. So I hope you enjoyed that and you found it interesting. If you did, and it was, and you haven't done so already, it would be great if you would consider subscribing to the channel. Also very helpful is pushing the like button of this video. And if you want to be informed of other content the channel uploads, then push the bell. Leave a comment. If I've made a boo-boo, let me know and we can try and put it right in the next video. Also, if you have this game, what do you think? Let me know. I love to read them. Thanks as always to my subscribers. Thank you very much. And just before I toddle off, one last thing. If you want to support the channel a little bit further, well, now you can. You can buy the channel a coffee. And all those coffees do indeed go towards new content for the channel to upload. If you want to check that out, then I'll leave a link in the description. And thank you. So for now, we'll leave the island of Peleliu. And until next time, as always, you take care and goodbye.